Okay, so they're preparing for the Queen's, Her Majesty's uh, ball, the big dance that they're um, they're going to have in her honor. And so everybody in the Lockton house is busy, and Madam is going to the ball with the Colonel. So of course she had a new dress made, and so she's busy getting her hair done and getting herself beautiful for the ball. Um, okay. Madam sent a note to her friend Jane Drinkwater, who, who agreed to bring her collection of necklaces and the latest gossip to tea. The news caused Madam to send the soldier wives pawing through the attic for a gown she had not worn yet this year. Hannah sent me to fetch more water, which I did with great pleasure, and a short detour. The houses on Warren Street were a mix. Some were modest. Two or three were rather grand, with arches over the windows and fancy boot scrapers by the front door. The trees and fences in the neighborhood had all been cut down for firewood. <coughs> it made the corner of Warren and Chapel Streets look undressed. I went round the back of the house with the red shutters, knocked on the door, and explained my errand to a maid, who fetched Captain Far Far Farrar for me, a horse-faced man with an easy laugh. Good, Captain Morse is indeed a gentleman, he said as I presented him with the coin. And you're the girl who carries the messages to his men in Bridewell Prison? Yes, sir. My lads are locked up in the old sugar house, he said, his smile fading. The ones that are still alive. He stood there caught up in a silence in his own thoughts. I tried to think of a polite way to take my leave, but could not find the proper words. The breeze came from the south and carried a salt tang with it. Although snow laid about and everyone was wrapped deep in their clothing, the appearance of the clouds made a body know, deep down, that spring was stirring. Yes, sir, I finally said, begging pardon, but I, I must be on my way. Of course, of course, he said, his eyes still distant. I walked down the path to Warren Street and stopped when I heard him call me. Sal, wait there a moment. I stood a while longer, watching the clouds and scolding myself for mixing in with the affairs of a gentleman in their honor. Several carriages containing bundled-up ladies and serious-looking officers passed along the street, pulled by shaggy-coated horses. Most folks took no, no, no more notice of me than they would a, a cartman selling oysters or a vagabond from Canvas Town. <clears throat> just, as I set, just as I set my mind to leave, Captain Farrar came back out. Give this to Morse, please, he said as he handed me the note. <coughs> He'll know what to do. I studied the folded paper and made bold. Another wager, sir? I asked. Another carriage passed on the street, the horses clip-clopping slow. He shook his head, the laughter gone from his eyes. No, news from the headquarters. Don't tarry with it. And he touched his fingertips to the brim of his cap. I bobbed a curtsy and took my leave, hurrying toward the tea water pump. I should have known I'd be pressed into more message carrying. These soldier types were forever scheming up one thing or another, and it put a girl it put a girl like me in a rough spot. Not that they ever thought about that. I didn't ask to ferry messages across the city for some captain that I didn't know. How was that connected to my deal with Dibden to treat Curzon properly? It wasn't. Not one bit. The good Captain Morse and Farrar would just have to wait till it suited me for this last message to be delivered. <clears throat> if I didn't get back soon, I would be in for it. <clears throat> I pushed through the back door to the locked in kitchen, still fussing about selfish captains who only thought of their own skins. <clears throat> when Curzon got out, he'd have a, he would have a debt of honor the size of a whale to pay me back. I'd make that boy... And I set down the water buckets, removed my cloak, and hung it from a peg near the fire. I stood rubbing my hands together and warming them over the flames. <clears throat> as soon as I could move them, I'd boiled, I had boiled up the water. The door from the front hall slammed open. There you are! The words came at me like shards of glass. And I turned. It was Madame Lockton holding a small riding crop in her hand. Ma'am? She crossed the room and slashed the cross, slashed the crop across my face. It hurt fierce, but I knew not to cry out. How dare you, she spat. So she slapped, 
Isabel across the face. It was kind of like a whip that they use for horses. And um, so, how dare you? How dare you what? Let's find out. I'm going to take a quick drink of my tea. <clears throat> my voice, voice is getting scratchy. <clears throat> okay, so this is chapter 43. Please, ma'am, I started. Silence! She, she cracked the crop across my shoulder now. The back door opened and Hannah, Hannah entered. Oh, excuse me, she said, turning to leave. Stay, madam ordered. Hannah let the door close and murmured, Yes, ma'am, her eyes stealing once to me and then quickly away. I fought the urge to run for the knife drawer. Madam paced in front of me. I have never in my entire life been so humiliated. She paused and put on a mimic face. I saw your little black girl talking to a rebel officer on Warren Street. Do you allow your slaves to consort with the enemy? I could not swallow nor breathe. She brought the crop down with a crack on the edge of the table. Jane Drinkwater said this to me. Jane Drinkwater, the biggest gossip in New, in New York. Madam paced again, her hair flying loose, her manner quite unsteady. I said, no, Jane, you must be mistaken. Not our Sal. Colonel Hawkins himself uses her for her, for her, for errands. She stopped suddenly. And Jane says, no, Anne, your girl was speaking to a rebel prisoner on Warren Street. It's hard to miss the mark on her face. From my carriage, I saw her take a note from his hand. I opened my mouth to protest, but she slashed at me again. This time the blow opened a cut on my forehead. Give me that note, Madam demanded. I have no note, ma'am, I said quiet. She held out her hand. Liar, give me that paper or I'll turn you over to the British commander so fast your full head will spin. Her voice shook with rage. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the folded note. Madam looked over to Hannah. See, you just need to be firm with them. Hannah said nothing. A drop of blood rolled down the side of my face. I clutched the note in my fist. Give it! Madam narrowed her eyes. Did you hear me, girl? Everybody carried a little evil in them, Mama once told me. Madam Lockton had more than her share of evil. The poison had eaten holes through her soul and made room for vermin to nest inside her. Girl! Madam stamped her foot on the floor. The evil inside me woke and crackled like lightning. I could wrap my hands around her throat. I could brain her with a poker, thrust her face into the flames. I could beat her senseless with just my fists. I shook from the effort of holding myself still, clutching the crumpled paper. Mama said we had to fight the evil inside us by overcoming it with goodness. She said it was a hard thing to do, but it made us worthy. I breathed deep to steady myself and I threw the captain's note in the fire. Hannah gasped. Madam shrieked and pushed me out of the way, but the paper was already on fire. She dropped the crop and smacked me again in the face with her hand as she had the day that I first landed in New York. You foul bloody wrench! She reached behind her, picked up a bowl, and hurled it at me. I ducked, and it crashed against the hearth. I will sell you, she screamed. I will auction you, auction you at dawn on Monday. I'll sell your demon sister, too, to the most cruel, heartless master I can find, the devil himself, if he wants. She paused to catch her breath. Ruth, I thought. Hannah stepped forward. I do believe there was a knock at the front door, madam, she said. But she had already sold Ruth. Madam glared at her. Then answer it, you bloody fool! Didn't she sell Ruth, I thought? As Hannah left, Madam brushed back her hair, gathered her dignity. I still stood by the fire, where the note had burned to fine ash. I could not think what might happen next. Madam tugged at her short gown. 
What's that stupid look on your face? She said with a harsh laugh. <laughs> you didn't know I still owned her, did you? Ruth? The name escaped my mouth. Brat! Madam spat. Couldn't find a buyer. Had to ship her down to Charleston. I shall tell the estate manager to get rid of her. Toss her in the swamp. Her death will be on your head, you insolent fool. Hannah came back in from the hall. It's the hairdresser, madam. What? Madam wheeled about. What did you say? The hairdresser has come to prepare you for the ball. The queen's ball, ma'am. You must leave in a few hours. Madam cleared her throat and stood straighter. <clears throat> of course. You must first help me into my gown. Hannah nodded. Yes, ma'am. Lock the girl in the potato bin and then come upstairs. Oh, poor Isabel, as if anything worse could happen to her. She's been she's been lashed by Madam, and now she finds out that Ruth really wasn't sold because nobody would buy her. She's been at the Charleston residence this whole time. And now Madam's locking Ruth, uh locking Isabel in the potato bin. Um so she can't get out. She's a prisoner within a prisoner. So poor Isabel, I don't know how much worse it can get, but we'll find out.